Hi everyone, welcome to this McGraw-Hill Online Exchange webinar. My name is Jenny McGarra and my Twitter handle is at Ms. McGarra. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. And with me is the great Sue. Do you want to introduce yourself? You're so very kind. I'm Sue Gorman and my Twitter, Twitter handle is at SJ Gorman. Today we're going to be talking about breaking down walls with an iPad, which sounds kind of dangerous, a lot of shattered glass, but all metaphorical, of course. Uh, before we dig in, just a little bit about ourselves so you know who we are and why we're talking to you about this. Um, I work in a network of 25 Chicago public schools called the Academy for Urban School Leadership. And we have uh, 35 plus iPad one-to-one -one classrooms in our 25 schools plus another um, two dozen rotating carts. Uh, Sue, do you want to tell us a little bit about Racine? Sure. I work in Racine Unified School District. Um, we have many iPad, um, iPads in our district. We have uh, many one-to-one -one classrooms, not grade levels yet, and uh, we are redefining our instruction through that. Very cool. So today on this webinar, we're going to be sharing with you some tips, tricks, and ideas that we have about how to use the iPad to transform your learning environments. Um, if you look at your screen, you'll have a section where you can ask questions or chat with us, which we encourage you to do because we'd love to hear more about uh, what you're thinking and what you're wondering. So please do ask questions. We see that we already have a question there that we'll get to. Um, but right now, we are going to go ahead and dig in. But again, feel free to interact or comment or respond using the question or the chat. All right, here we go. So today we're going to be talking about innovating our schools. Um, and talk about specifically how to use iOS or iPads, iPod touches, um, iOS devices, including the Apple TV, to transform teaching and learning in your classroom. So to start off, I always like to tell the story about the three little pigs. Um, my background is that I was a fourth and fifth grade teacher for years and years, so I like telling stories to my kids. So today we're going to start off with story time. Um, and normally I ask the audience at this point how many of you have heard of the Three Little Pigs, but I can't see if they're raising your hand, so I'm going to all assume you say yes. And uh, while we've all heard the story, we often forget that that third little piggy is an early innovator. He was transformative in the way that he used the tools and materials he had at hand, because after all, that first little piggy, he built his house out of straw, but that third little piggy built his house out of bricks. And so he survived to tell his tale. Um, so let's revise this story and rewrite it and pretend that it, instead that first little piggy who built his house out of straw, um, he wrote a grant for the new innovative device known as the brick. And he won that grant because he's an amazing grant writer. And when he received his bricks, uh, instead of creating a brick house, he simply duct taped the bricks to his house, which doesn't seem very structurally sound. And as we can all say, what's going to happen to his house? it's going to collapse. And you're going to have one very sad little piggy. So what we want to think about instead of duct taping the brick store house is how to knock down that metaphorical straw house that is our classroom. And how can we knock down the existing pedagogy and best practices that we have that we created with paper and pencil? But now that we have a new tool, not bricks, but iPads, how can we rebuild our classroom from the ground up and blueprint a new structure and create new best practices and pedagogy? So instead of just saying, hey, I've always done literature circles this way, or I've always done um, math centers that way, well, that's the way that we did it when the best tool that we had was a photocopier. Now that we have this innovative new device like the iPad, how are you going to build it from the ground up, and how are you going to truly harness the power of this device? So the way that we want to look at this is to look at a continuum. Um, Sue and I and many of our colleagues use something called the SAMR model by Dr. Ruben Puentadera. It's a four-step model that's broken into two main sections, enhancement and transformation. And many of us who are using technology usually come in at this lowest level, the substitution level, where your technology is just substituting what you could do with paper and pencil. Uh, so that's where you see a lot of math apps or, fra or uh, literacy apps, just games that are um, basically uh, extended practice, reinforcement, and review. However, what we really want to be focusing on is the redefinition level. That's when you are allowing students and teachers to uh, engage in activities that are at higher levels of rigor and critical thinking that were previously impossible without the devices that you have. 
for example, creation or collaborative level activities that we're going to see in just a few minutes. So we're aiming for redefinition, not uh, review or um, simple fact memorization apps that you might see uh, clouding up and um, cluttering a lot of app stores, both on Android and iOS. So we're going to look at three main sections, how to redefine assessment, collaboration, and uh, differentiation. But we're going to start today with assessment. So let's think about authentic learning. And as we're ass assessing kids, let's move away from standardized testing. And let's think about how to make assessment more powerful. So uh, I take a page out of a colleague's book, Dan Meyer. He's a fellow Apple Distinguished Educator and overall math smarty pants from California. He's a PhD candidate at uh, Stanford. And he has this whole concept about three acts math and how to make mathematics a lot more um, accessible for our kids, but a lot more real world and authentic. If you want to learn more about him, please uh, look him up. It's Dan Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. He has a great website. And uh, what's amazing about him is a lot of his curriculum is Creative Commons licensed and available for you to download. So his whole idea is video mathematics. He takes videos that are um, thought provoking and gets kids to consider their own math questions. And I thought, hey, I could do that too. So I took my phone to the local grocery store and I made this video. It's eight ounces, and for this package, I would be paying $2.99 on sale today for $2.99 for eight ounces of sharp cheddar cheese. $2.99 for eight ounces of the Simple Discern brand. Or, I came over here and I noticed. So I go on to take a look at all the different cheeses I can buy, and I didn't tell my kids, hey, what's the cheaper cheese? I let them discuss it. And they had a discussion about what they wanted to think about with that video. And of course, they all came, well, not of course, but eventually they all came up with the question, which is the cheaper cheese? Because they had gone grocery shopping with their families before. So then I used an app called EduCreations. Uh, recently, we started using a different screencasting app called Doceri, D-O-C-E-R-I. It's a great free app. Um, and we use that to screencast the student's metacognition. I had a little boy named Eddie who wasn't paying any attention to what was going on in class. And um, he was kind of cranky that day. And then when he gave me his answer, he said $16. And I didn't think he was paying attention because what I had hoped the kids were going to do is find the unit price. So how many, um, uh, how many cents per ounce was this cheese? So I was thinking, gosh, Eddie doesn't really understand it. He wasn't paying attention. I'm going to have to reteach it. But then I watched his video, and I realized that that wasn't quite it. So let's take a look at what Eddie did. Some people are having a hard time hearing the audio. Um, Sue, are you able to hear it? Yes, I am. 
Okay, so if you're having a hard time hearing it, please put it in the question answer or chat box. I tried adjusting the audio, and if you still can't hear it, um, let me know. I don't know how many more videos that we have that have audio, but hopefully, um, oops. But um, even if you couldn't hear Eddie's narration, you could um, hopefully at least see his, um, see his screencasting. And what you, um, hopefully, if you didn't hear, what you might have seen, and I'll just bring it to the screen, is a couple of things. First of all, Eddie is a visual learner. You could see that he created all of these drawings to help him. Second of all, even if you couldn't hear it, um, you might have seen that what he was trying to do oops, was take um, the 32 ounces of cheese and divide it by the $8 that the 32 ounces, um, I'm sorry, and divide it by the $8 here and figure out how many um, dollars per ounce it is. And he came up with four. And he was doing it algebraically. Instead of doing 32 divided by 8, he did 32 divided by 4 equals 8 and put the answer in the middle as a variable. Additionally, he also um, was estimating. So instead of saying 299, he rounded it to $3. Um, and I could go on and on if we were talking about more about digital math, math metacognition and differentiation about the way he made his own math path. But the basic um, underlying truth here is that Eddie totally understood what he was doing. He made an amazing, beautiful strategy that was his own. Um, he created his own pathway to learning. He showed his work, and he narrated it and explained it well. So if we're looking at Common Core State Standards here, SMP 3 and 4, you know, looking at your own uh, mathematical work, analyzing the thinking of others, explaining your own thinking, it's really great work here. And I wouldn't have really been able to tap into it had I not been able to screencast uh, Eddie's thinking and see it. I had 34 students in my homeroom last year, and I would not have had time to go around and hear all 34 of them work simultaneously. But this allowed me the luxury of hearing it after the fact. Um, and I know, Sue, can you share a little bit? Because I know that you're using a similar technique in your schools, correct? Yes, we are. Um, we're trying to do the same thing in um, some of our um, uh, local places that would have familiarity to our students also to say, you know, uh, this is this percent off and, uh, you know, we need to buy um, this or, you know, this in, in our local uh, area. And it's really helped the kids because it's real world and relevant versus just having a problem in a, in a book or on a worksheet. Absolutely. So it's, it's a great way to, to make it more authentic, but also, like you said, um, relevant and immediate. So something else that we like to think about when we're talking about assessment is learning management systems. And what I used to use were Google Forms and conditional formatting. So I created a Google Form and I conditionally formatted it so that students came in and uh, got their answers in real time. But then what I realized the downside of that was I couldn't um, they couldn't get feedback. They didn't get instant feedback if they were right or wrong. Because when you submit a Google form, you don't see the results of your own form. So uh, what we've done was look at Schoology and Edmodo. And recently, we've liked Schoology better because it has better iOS integration, which we'll talk about more in this webinar. It's free. Um, so here's a screenshot from an iPad. And you can see this is a, a Schoology assessment I've created. But the beautiful thing about Schoology assessments over Google Forms and Edmodo are that you can embed naturally media into the assessment. So whereas in a Google Form, you can't do it at all. And on Edmodo, when you embed media, it shows up as a tiny thumbnail or a link. Um, Schoology embeds pictures and video into questions and answer choices of their assessments um, naturally. So you can see here I have embedded these photos. And um, this is a matching uh, question. They were supposed to match the QR code to its name and the iPad, what is this, and a Chromebook. And this is the answer here. Um, but you can do that with match the polygon to its name or match the animal to which, uh, you know, is it an amphibian fish? bird, mammal, you could say um, which of the following things is a polyhedra, um, lots of different things. Watch this clip and tell me what genre movie it is. So you're able to do a lot more with the quizzes and make them multimedia. Um, also, they get that instant feedback that we we're always saying. So here, after a student has submitted their assessment that I've created, they were able to um, see which answers were correct and incorrect. And you can see here is an embedded video. They watched a quick screencast. Um, and I, had, I wanted them to know uh, what I was using in it. 
And then I can also take a look at the students' work and see how they're doing and get feedback about um, how they did. And then I can also see some statistics of how the kids are doing, which is pretty amazing. And um, yes, I always like to point out this is a standard deviation for an exit ticket, which might be more uh, data than you may need, but it is still very helpful. Um, to see maybe the average score, the highest grade, the lowest grade, the median, and the mode for your class, and something you could talk about as a class group. So that's uh, how we're talking about redefining assessment. Those are a few quick tools. We could talk about it all day. But Sue, do you have anything that you want to share about your schools and teachers and how they're using the iPads to transform their assessment? Um, yes, we, um, we are using uh, Google Forms a lot in our school to um, do our exit tickets and then to differentiate from there. But um, it really has been so powerful, um, not only um, with the Google um, exit tickets, but also, like you had said before, using the metacognition piece of having the students being able to recreate what they were doing in something like an educreations or especially explain everything. I think when teachers can actually hear the thought process of the students as they go through the problem, that is the key that is really helping us because we really understand exactly like you showed in the example of your student how he got that answer because, you know, like you had said, hmm, how would he have just come up with that? But there's so much more to it um, when you can hear what they're saying. And that's the part that I think is so very powerful. I agree. Um, and I think that's the big thing, too, is to rethink how we're looking at assessment. So it's not simply about what's the right or wrong answer, but, you know, what's the pathway, right? Absolutely. All right, cool. So we're going to keep looking on and think about how we're redefining differentiation now. And this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so here we have a video. Uh, this is my classroom from, I think, two years ago. Um, and I was teaching everyday math to fifth graders. This was a factors um, and arrays lesson. And what I had done was used an exit ticket like a Google Form or Schoology or Edmodo to find out how they were doing. So in that 60-minute math period, I might have done a quick 15-minute mini lesson. And then I gave them an exit ticket. And then since I got the feedback immediately about what they knew and didn't know, I was able to to assign them differentiated, individualized, um, personalized playlists. So I created these video mini lessons for the kids to watch that was about factors and arrays at different levels um, of entry, different modalities. You can see some of the kids are taking notes, while others are using drawings and diagrams, and yet others are using um, actual manipulative. Some kids have counters, and I'm doing it on the iPad, and they're following along. But this way, I'm able to differentiate on an individual level for the kids based on the, uh, their same day assessment. So I'm closing that assessment loop. If they didn't get something that day, I can meet them in their moment of cognitive dissonance and give them an immediate video um, video mini lesson to meet their needs. So while a lot of people, oops, a lot of people like to say that this is flipping the classroom, we like to call it cloning the teacher. So um, instead of one Miss McGarrah, there are many Miss McGarrahs all over the classroom, bringing the ratio of 34 to 1 down to maybe 2 to 1 or even 3 to 1. Meanwhile, I wasn't hanging out in the back of the room watching, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians. I was actually meeting with a small group and uh, working with them with live kinesthetic uh, learning that they needed beyond video lessons. Um, I also wanted to show you really quickly a quick video um, example. In this, in this particular example, I am using Keynote and screencasting using QuickTime to create a SightWords video. And um, please continue to let me know in the questions or chat if you can't hear um, any of the audio. Girls, today we're going to learn about Sight words. Today is lesson one. Here are your directions. <coughs> First, you're going to listen to say the word, and you're going to look at a picture of the word. Then, when you see this symbol, you're going to write the word on your handwriting paper. Make sure you spell it correctly. Ready? Let's go! Here's your first word. Cat. My sister has a pet cat. Cat. Go ahead and write cat on your handwriting paper now. If you need more time, you can pause this video so that you can write the word writing paper. Ready to check your work? Here's how we spell cat. C-A-T. Cat. Great. Let's go to the next word. 
So that's another example of how we use screencasting and video mini lessons to clone the teacher. Um, and that, kinder, that was a kindergarten that was a kindergarten sight word video that we had created to do some of our sight word assessments. And instead of doing one uh, spelling assessment where you walk around the room and you have your list of words and the kids all can't keep up, instead we um, decided to differentiate the actual assessment and have the kids get their own level sight word assessment based on where they were at. So if they were um, on you know, site word list one, they got that video. If they're on site word list 10, they got a different video. So in that way, we were able to differentiate that assessment for in that classroom, there were 27 kindergartners and one teacher. Um, Anne had a great question. She wanted me to clarify what an exit ticket was. For those of you who don't use that language, it's the quick assessment that you give when the kids um, walk out of your classroom. Um, Usually, that's when teachers give it, thus the exit ticket. Um, however, we've started to use it um, mid-class so that we could do something about it that same day. So as soon as we're done with the mini lesson, we give them a quick um, one or two question assessment to find out um, if, they're, if they're getting it, if they're picking up what we're putting down, if you will, or if they're still confused and we need to do some reteaching or scaffolding. So uh, let me know if that doesn't answer it, and we can revisit that some more. Um, Sue, are you guys using any video differentiation in any of your classrooms? We are quite a bit. Um, we use, um, like you did, we record from our document camera. We also like to have students um, do the recording from the document camera as well and kind of take ownership of some of the teaching too, which has been very awesome for them. And we also record, we do screencasts too from our uh, interactive whiteboards because you can record from that as well. And, and, and we do the uh, QuickTime screencasting and it really um, has been so beneficial to us. and. Um, you know, Jenny, I have to do a huge shout out to you because after watching what you did with your math video, um, we have a lot of teachers doing that as well. And like I said, um, it really helps all learners. Like Jenny said, it clones the teachers because now you can shoot out those videos to the students who need um, the appropriate ones, and it is personalized learning for them, and that's what it's all about. Absolutely. Um, and was it hard for your teachers to pick up on that and your kids? I love that the kids are doing it too. Absolutely. No, it was not hard at all. Um, it was really um, quite easy because you're already teaching the lesson. So once they you know, quickly learned the recording features on any of those devices, and the students do, it um, is just natural now. So they can pretty much, we're having uh, student-led technology nights, and they're actually showing parents and uh, their guests on how, um, how they can do that uh, uh, recording. So it's really wonderful. Very cool. Thanks, Sue. Um, so I'm going to pause this video real quick. So this next tool is iBooks Author. Um, I know um, a lot of people are starting to dig into that, and it's a great way for people to um, explore another mode of differentiation. Um, in this particular example, I had a student, John Paul, and he's reading um, iBooks Author. I'm screencasting this particular, uh, his iPad, so that you can see what he's doing, because there's no app to screencast the actual iPad screen. So what I'm using is an app uh, for your computer called Ref Reflector, R-E-F-L-E-C-T-O-R, -E Reflector. It used to be called Reflection. And with Reflector, I can reflect everything that's happening on my iPad to my computer. And then I use a computer app like QuickTime to screencast it. So here is uh, John Paul using Reflector, I'm sorry, using iBooks Author to um, differentiate for himself. Oops, let's go back. If I can find my mouse, oh, technical difficulties here. It is 4.54 billion years old and has abstained from continue from an extended period or without interruption. Life for over 3 billion years. The radius is of Earth is an average of 6,371 kilometers. Its circumference uh -huh, the distance around circle or sphere is 4,075,017 and kilometers. So what he was reading, he was reading the 
Yes. He was reading the iBook and know a word. He was able to click on it because I added it to the um, glossary. And then he was able to tap on this picture of the Earth to um, unlock a, an embedded secret video that I had uh, hidden in there so that we could actually make this iBook truly multimedia. And then if we continue through it, um, he moves on once the video is finished um, after seeing some examples of the Earth to the next page. So it's a great way to create your own differentiated content, especially when you have kids who are reading below grade level and there aren't um, really good uh, high interest, low level books out there, you can start to create your own. I have a colleague, Anita Orozco Huffman, who is a middle school special ed teacher and has created dozens and dozens of her own iBooks to differentiate and scaffold for her um, middle schoolers who are reading at much lower grade levels so that they can feel confident about what they're doing. Uh, Sue, have you worked at all with iBooks? Yes, and we're excited, like I said, once again to have student-created iBooks. So we can take the um, Common Core standard and the content standard and go ahead and have the students um, recreate one for themselves. And like you had said before, the authoring and the ownership on that is amazing. And, and a lot of things that we do with that are specific to um, our content in Wisconsin. So it's very um, good to do like history of Wisconsin and, and different things like that. And the students really find it so meaningful. Um, are your teachers finding the iBooks author tool hard to work with? Um, not so much. I mean, it's a little bit at first when you first start out, but I think the ease of use is, is there. I really do. I think that it, it makes a lot of sense and the tools are um, very intuitive. So it's going really well. I agree. And for those of you who haven't used iBooks Author, um, it looks a lot like Pages, if you're familiar with that um, program, or even um, Microsoft Word. So it's, it's really not a huge learning curve. You're not, you know, uh, coding or using HTML, anything like that. It's just a matter of text boxes and typing. If you know PowerPoint or Pages or Word, you should be able to do it. And um, it's pretty fun to use. It is fun, Oops, and the, the fact that you can also put in little quizzes and uh, little assessment pieces is kind of neat as well. Yeah, that's something else. You can embed widgets and quizzes into it. The one thing about iBooks Author, though, is if the kids take the assessment, it's more of a self-assessment. It does not, um, it doesn't like dump the data into a spreadsheet for you to use as an assessment class-wide. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so that's. That's differentiation again in a nutshell. There's many other ways that the iPad can personalize learning. Do you want to share any tools that we didn't share, um, Sue, that specifically about differentiation? Um, I'm trying to think of which ones. Let's see. Um, I think we covered most of the ones that we are using. Does anybody have any questions out there? Does anybody make a comment on different ones that they use? Um, let's see here. Billy is asking, are the sharing features embedded into iBooks Author? If you're talking about sharing the actual iBook, um, you don't. There, that's confusing. Uh, there's a button for publish, and that's publishing it to the iTunes Store. You actually want to share it out, and then you can sync it to the iPads, or um, you know, attach it to an email or a web page, and the kids can download it. If you mean sharing features in terms of the kids creating their own digital content and sharing it out from the iBook, no, not that I know of. Um, Sue, do you know if there's anything like that built into iBooks Author where the kids can create content and share it out from the iBook? No, I do not. Yeah, I, th I think that it's a one-way street. Um, Anne also asked, does Reflector allow you to work wirelessly from an iPad to a smart board? And the answer is yes, if it's connected to a computer. So the app Reflector that you download directly to your computer, to your MacBook or your PC computer, um, once you download it, it allows your um, I, iPad to connect and mirror wirelessly to that computer through Wi-Fi and if you have that computer hooked up to a smart board then it will also show up there. Um, Rebecca asked about a word that I said but I'm not sure which word she's talking about uh, so if she wants to message more and then Allison asked how we send the videos to our students to their individual iPads Personally, I sync all the videos to, um, through our Brettford PowerSync cart because our Wi-Fi isn't strong enough to stream 35 videos from the internet at the same time. However, I have colleagues who work in schools with some pretty amazing wireless networks. And um, in those cases, they're actually sending the videos to the kids either through YouTube channels, Vimeo, um, embedded into iBooks, and some of them are using Schoology and Edmodo and embedding the video into an assignment. 
How about you, Sue? How are you guys sending uh, video mini lessons to your kids? Sure, we do it a few different ways. Um, some of the ways that you suggested as well. We can also share out um, some of the videos via their um, Google Drive because we are a Google Apps district too, so uh, they can go ahead uh, that way as well. Um, and basically that's how we're sharing. Um, Andy also suggested, can you link an iBook file online to have kids download to their individual devices? That's a great idea and suggestion, and you can. A lot of us have Google Sites or uh, Weeblies or Wikis that we're using as our classroom website or even Schoology or Edmodo. And you can definitely um, have each kid have a group page where you can um, put the day's iBook and the kids can download it straight from the website. The only downside, again, from that is if you want to be cautious about bandwidth and Wi-Fi. If you, have, if you feel confident that all your kids can download it without an issue, then go for it. However, if you have uh, bandwidth issues, then I would uh, suggest hard syncing it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our last area for today and our, my favorite, which is collaboration. And so um, beyond differentiating for our kids and assessment, which is all more teacher driven, it's really cool when the kids take the reins and become uh, the drivers for their own learning. So let's take a look here. Here's Edmodo again. And this is an example of a discussion that you can have on Schoology. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I just said Edmodo. This is Schoology. And um, here's a discussion they have on Schoology. And what I really like about this is unlike Edmodo, you can have threaded comments. So example, Maverick said Schoology is better. And then Malia, who's actually his big sister, was able to reply directly to him and say, why is Schoology better? They can also like each other's comments, like Facebook. And then you can see here on the right-hand side, I'm able to grade their comments. That's what these little boxes are. So I can click on these and grade their comments. If I click, oops, sorry about that. If I click here on filter by user, I can then see how many students responded, which students responded, and how many times they did. So it's a great way to have kids have silent discussions um, as they do now or to do some silent Socrative seminars. In this example, I have um, my students using an Apple TV. And what's happening here is the students are using the Apple TV to uh, stream what they're working on up to the screen up there and to narrate their thinking. So here we have one little girl, Destiny, streaming her work up to the screen and sharing what she knows. And then another little boy, Johnny, is going to say that he wants to share his work because he noticed that she didn't show her work and he thinks that her labels aren't quite accurate. So I'm going down to his iPad and I'm selecting the Apple TV to mirror. And I turn the mirroring on and Johnny goes whoosh with his arms. And there's all of Johnny's beautiful work with the base of his polyhedra shaded in with all of his work color coded. Um, and the app that he used to do this was Paperport Notes. So it's a great way to uh, uh, stop working in the front of the classroom and create every student's desktop is the front of the classroom and make it a lot easier for kids to share their work and um, have a voice. Sue, do you guys have Apple TVs in any of your classrooms? We just have um, just a couple. So we are just implementing that. But yes, just a couple at this point. Yeah, and um, it's, it's, it's an, that's another bandwidth issue, too. Um, Apple TV, uh, you need to make sure you have the right network settings. It doesn't work on enterprise. It needs to run on a wireless network that runs something called Bonjour. So you definitely want to check it out with your IT folks before you invest. But it's only $99. It's not an actual TV. It's just a little box that connects to any HDMI um, projector or television set. Uh, but it's, it's a great way to do it. And if you want to learn more about it, um, District 58 in um, outside of Chicago, Illinois, in Downers Grove, Illinois, has gone, to, um, has gone to scale with it. An Apple Distinguished Educator named Scott Meech has put an Apple TV in all 13 of his elementary schools in every single classroom. And I had the honor of visiting them recently, and it was, pretty, it was downright amazing to see what they were doing with it. And I um, love to see how that collaboration piece works, just like you showed in your classroom, Jenny, how then the students can um, go ahead and reflect their work. And so it, it literally makes every student have their own interactive whiteboard in front of them, and then to be able to share and collaborate um, is huge. Absolutely. And it, it's, so, it's so amazing because with Promethean boards and smart boards, um, you're often stuck at the front of the room, right? So you usually walk into those classrooms, and it's the teacher at the front of the room, using that device and all the kids are just sitting there watching him and her. And in a really good classroom, maybe the kids come up to the front of the room to do some work. However, um, 
with, the, with the Apple TV as an interactive solution, the kids are the ones who are controlling the learning. And that, that's so powerful. Yes, it is. Um, Sharon wanted to verify, yes, the app uh, is Paperport Notes that is being shown here. It's a free PDF annotation app, and it allows the kids to uh, write over any PDF and to um, have a myriad of tools. However, Doceri, uh, D-O-C-E-R-I, is another one that we really like, and it's also free, and it allows you to annotate over a PDF, but also to screencast. And it also works better with Apple TV because Paperport Notes gets a little bit buggy when you're trying to, um, to display. So Doceri, D-O-C-E-R-I, would be our recommended app for, um, for screencasting and also for uh, PDF annotation. Billy had a, another question. Is there any contact info for Scott Meech? Um, Sue, do you have his Twitter handle handy? Is it S. Meech? It is. It's, it, it, it looks like Smeech. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yep. At S M is in Mary E E C H. So Scott Meech, uh, go ahead and send him a tweet. He's super collaborative and somebody you could talk to more about how they're using the Apple TVs in his district. Um, so let's continue. Um, oops. In this example, I um, you can see my students are using Skype in this example, and what we were doing in this. Um, lesson was we were looking at uh, social justice and spending in schools. This was on the eve of the Chicago Teachers Union strike and my kids were wondering about why their teachers weren't going to be in school and what was going on and they said is it just because of money? So um, they started their own challenge based unit, pro unit project, learning unit project and wanted to learn more about spending in school. So my school is on the um, south side of Chicago, 100% African American, 99% um, low income, and we were Skyping with a school that was a mile and a half north of us. And you can see that this class is a lot more racially diverse than ours. And the essential question they were supposed to be talking to each other about is, um, how, what do you have in your classroom that you couldn't live without? But instead, when my kids saw those students, they said, oh, they have white kids in their class. And all of the, the teacher on our, my side and the teachers on the other side were um, a little bit at a loss for words at first. And we weren't sure how to proceed. So we said, you know what, this is a learning experience. Let's go with it. And I asked my kids, why did you say that? And they said, because, look right there, there's some white kids in their class. Do you see them? Right there. Why, <laughs> where did they come from? How did you get them? And so uh, we had a whole discussion about that. And my kids didn't realize that other schools weren't fully um, uh, single race, that they were more diverse, uh, not only um, ethnically, but socioeconomically diverse schools in other parts of the city, um, even as close as a, a mile from them. So we had that discussion, and then the kids on the other side, in the more, um, this is actually an also more affluent school, asked the question, I thought that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ended segregation and slavery, how come that school has, still has racism and segregation? And we were, and the other class said, are we segregated? They looked at me and they were like, are we allowed to go to another school? So instead of talking about the resources, we ended up having this really great discussion about um, financial segregation and socioeconomics and the city of Chicago and the different neighborhoods. And it was, it was so intense because we had third, fourth, and fifth graders deep digging into really serious questions that we didn't think that they would be emotionally or mature, um, mature enough to have, but they totally were, all because we were able to video chat with one another and have them collaborate. Moving forward from this, they continued talking to this class and having um, partnerships to discuss social justice issues and how to make a difference in um, their own community and city of Chicago. So that was really, really powerful. We've also used Skype and FaceTime to have experts Skype in and talk to our kids and to um, have kids problem solve together. Uh, Sue, so are you guys using any video conferencing in your classrooms? We do use Skype a bit. We're doing some mystery Skypes, actually, with a couple ADs coming up, which is pretty awesome as well. Um, but yes, we do. And we, what we want to do, or what we're doing as well, is um, bringing it back to um, at the very beginning of this, uh, this um, uh, podcast here, too, is talking about how we do math challenges as well. We're starting to do some um, challenges uh, visually with some classes across the country. And um, then by either the end of the day or end of a couple of days, come up with, you know, have discussions on that area of how we, you know, solve problems and do some things uh, that way too. But I totally believe 
that um, through all this, you know, it really makes the world your classroom. On any given day, you can have anywhere, anyone from anywhere in the world come in and give expert advice to your students. And to me, that is just so awesome, that authentic learning from students, um, just like you had said too, Jenny, you know, even just a mile away. But to be able to bring those real life experiences into our classroom is just so beneficial. And speaking of that, can you tell, can you explain what a mystery Skype is for people who are uh, tuning in who don't know about it? Sure. There's um, mystery Skype is something that you can have, uh, you can uh, sign up for, or you can uh, collaborate with um, another school or something. And so then what happens is uh, the places can um, uh, do a Skype session and they can uh, not really know who their um, who their person is going to be who's uh, coming to visit their classroom. So that is just something that's. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> um, very cool. And my kids really like uh, Mystery Skypes as well. They think it's a great way to connect with others and they love uh, asking questions, kind of like 20 questions to find out where they're coming from. Exactly. Um, so, really quick, let's talk about another great app for collaboration. This is called Ask3. This is another free app from TechSmith. Um, it's one of my favorite apps that just came out a couple months ago this past fall, I believe. And what it allows you to do is to have collaborative uh, screencast sharing. So, um, it's part a uh, screencasting app, and it's also part almost like VoiceThread. So you have, it, when you sign in, it starts like this. You create a class. Uh, you sign in as a teacher or a student. Um, and then you can create a screencast. Uh, you can see you have tools down here just like explain everything or show me or edu creations. So you create your little video lesson. Or um, as a student, you can create one where you show what you don't understand, what you're confused about. And then as soon as you're done and you upload it, it's immediately on a bulletin board for all the other kids in your class to see. So all those thinking issues that we were talking about earlier go away with this, with this solution because as soon as you create a screencast, everyone in your class can see it. So that's cool in and of itself, but there's more. So then as your colleagues, either your peers as classmates or your students, if you're a teacher, are watching that screencast, they can respond to it. So you can either respond to it in asking a question or you can respond to it by clicking on this little record button down here and you can take over the screencast and create your own video screencast either showing how you would solve the problem or explaining how to do it if somebody's confused or explaining a question that you have. And it shows up as threaded replies just like this for everyone in the class to see. So it's really pretty powerful tool and it's free, which I, I'm just blown away that this tool that can do so much is free. So buy it while they're hot and, um, and hopefully before they decide to charge for it. So I know that you just started playing with this a couple uh, days ago at ICE. Have you had a chance to investigate any further with this app? I just started showing some teachers this, and this is the one they were most excited about. So I'm really anxious to see um, how um, all the different ways they will incorporate this. But I, I have to agree with you, Jenny. The fact that this is free is amazing, and um, it's such a powerful tool. Yeah, so quickly download it before, before TechSmith realizes that they should be charging. Hopefully they never do, but just in case. Um, so that's redefining collaboration, but before we move on to chat about anything else, I wanted to bring up something. Our friend Andy Lozick, who's an Apple Distinguished Educator from the beautiful state of Michigan, pure Michigan, um, is on, and he shared another great tool with us in the chat here called Chirp. And Andy says that teachers can send out a Chirp to the other iPads um, that they listen for, and when they pick it up, the teacher's iPad sends the files that they want to share wirelessly to those picking up the chirp. And he likens it to the old days uh, when you were doing, um, I think, a Blackberry Beam is what he's talking about. Um, and Andy, please um, say in the uh, chat if I got that wrong or if you want to share anything else about that. But I believe it's called Chirp. And um, if I'm inferring correctly, this is an app that he's talking about. Um, have you heard about this one, Sue? No, I have not. Yeah, me neither. So, um, but I'm and, so glad that Andy's joining us. Yeah, and um, if I could make my computer work, we could probably share out more information from Andy, but I, I can't for some reason click on this control panel right now anymore, so I'm going to stop trying. Um, so then uh, we're going to say open up for some more questions. If you haven't already asked a question, please do, and we have a couple more uh, minutes to respond to them. But while, we're, while you're thinking of questions that you might have for the Q&A portion of this webinar, I'm going to leave you with my students, um, with my students 
Caleb, and Caleb is a fourth grader in this video. Now he's a fifth grader. And what had happened was Caleb had tried out the great app Explain Everything. And that was back when Explain Everything was in its infancy and it was still working out some bugs. And what I was doing was having my kids uh, create a student genius bar in the classroom. So instead of me being the only one who held all the knowledge of iPads and decided what apps that we bought, they would vet apps before we purchased them and they would also be the support staff for their uh, colleagues in the classroom. And so I had come across Explain Everything and I was super geeked up about it. So I had my kids try it out and they didn't like it at all. They thought it was too complicated, they hated it, and they blogged about it. And I put it on my blog and the creator, Rayshawn Richards, immediately saw it and responded to me and said, hey, could I talk to your kids? And he was really um, nice about it. He was like, I don't want to yell at them or give them a hard time about not liking my app. I want to make it a better app, which he has done an amazing job of doing. Um, but I, I just want to know what they don't like about it. So he gets on Skype with Caleb and uh, Caleb then basically uh, tells and what's what. And I think that he probably expected Caleb to be a little bit more nervous and quiet about it, but Caleb was not shy and he said, here's what I don't like about it. I don't like this. And he used words like interface, which I didn't know Caleb knew. Um, and then three or four months later, Rayshawn sends me an email and says, hey, I re-released the app with all of those bug fixes that Caleb found. And when I told Caleb uh, the word peacocking and, you know, puffing out his chest. That's the perfect description of how he felt. Um, and Caleb was a little bit shyer and uncomfortable because he was new to our school just the year before. And this gave him such confidence. And here's Caleb talking about that experience. Hi, my name is Caleb and I go to NTA. And the thing I like about iPads is when, when I come to school, when I come to school, I like to come, come to school because I had iPads when I was in third grade. I, I, I used to do anything so so I won't come to school like try to get a fever so so I won't have to come to school and go to the doctor for that day and when I came to fourth grade I was kind of nervous because I didn't know how to use no iPad this and the Garrett um show me um show me how to use the iPad and also um it, uh, the iPad made me feel valuable because because I, I was talking I was talking to this grown up and I was talking um, and I had I told this grown up well, what he should do what he should do to the um to the iPad apps to make it um, better, and, and that's how uh, iPads changed my, um, changed my life. So, um, then he's like, you know, I didn't want to come to school, I tried to get a fever, I, you know, I did anything I could to get out of school, and then he talks about, you know, the idea of empowerment, which is, which is so amazing, that's what we want for our students. Um, so. So um, we have a few more minutes, and there's a couple more questions. Um, Debbie wants to know about the last app, and I believe she might be talking about Ask3. Mm -hmm. um, so Debbie, if you're talking about this app, it's Ask3, um, all one word, from TechSmith. Um, let's see what else we have here. Whitney wants to know about Chirp, and yes, the app is called Chirp. And if um, Andy's still on and he wants to share more about that, that's great. Um, the app you said we should all get before charging it. Yeah, and Debbie, it is Ask3 that we were talking about. So yeah. those are the only questions that we had come in. So Sue, do you want to add anything else about, you know, why, I think another question that people are always asking is why iPad? So, you know, you're, you're the innovation specialist for your district. Why is it that your district is using iPads over netbooks or, or laptops? What is it about this device that's so transformative? I think uh, the main reason about this device that's so transformative is the fact of its, um, huge multimedia features um, and the accessibility features. We have um, students, you know, uh, who can uh, turn, use all those different accessibility features um, for whatever their need might be. And uh, that part to me is uh, transformative right there because it's personalized for all learners. I also think too that um, the content creation piece of this bar none, um, any other device does not match it. So the fact that you can do so much authoring on there, and that's where I really think that uh, the student um, Learn, learning is driven by the fact that they are the authors of the content and it's so much more engaging and meaningful. Just like your student just said, you know, people are excited to come to school because, oh my gosh, maybe we're going to do the newscast off of it today. We're going to make an iMovie today of expanded notation where we actually are going to, you know, take movies, we're going to edit it in uh, language arts and 
uh, go ahead and, and put it into you know uh, something multimedia and share it out globally with the world. And you can do that all very readily on this device. And the fact that you can take it, I said I like to call it our new pencil. You can take it to art class and take your stylus and draw amazing art and share it out. You know, in Phi Ed, we can go ahead and take that too and do not only nutrition units, but we can go ahead and say, hmm, let's download that app for heart rate, or let's download that app, you know, that we're going to do speed or accuracy when we're doing running or jumping or whatever we're doing. And then also music. Oh my goodness, you know, we can't afford in our district to have enough instruments for our kids. But when you have an app like GarageBand, and you have kids that instantaneously can make music to go along with what they're doing and, and do beats and rhythm and really um, make it culturally relevant as well to all the students that we serve to uh, be able to bring that into any content area. So if we're talking about social studies, you know, we can fly to Google Earth right in there on our iPad, go ahead and create some music that we feel would go along with that, then go ahead and take it into even maybe an app that has to do with cooking to talk about, okay, what ingredients would we use if we were visiting this country or culture? Go ahead and draw about it, write about it, talk about it. And then the biggest thing that we found in our district, too, is the fact that when students make the videos and they can watch it over and over again, because sometimes as a learner, um, you need to be reminded what you learned yesterday because, you know, sometimes we forget or we have uh, things like that. And the fact that they can go ahead on each and every day and watch again, either through the videos that they made, the screencasts they made, or that their teachers made, that metacognition piece is huge. So I just, um, I don't know, it's a, it's a really good device, I think, for personalized learning for um, all users. And if I do have to do one more shout out to an app, I do want to talk about ProKit because that was oh. And we have used that so much, Jenny, I cannot even tell you. So if you have not um, downloaded Crokit, um, it is a fabulous app. It gives you 30 seconds of free audio. You can make QR codes out of it immediately because it gives you a, a, your own URL. But boy, we're having a lot of fun with that one. Sue, so we can't go anywhere without talking about Crokit, right? That's true. <laughs> and we got to we gotta um, share out um, my, oh, friend, yes. my friend's blog, right? Absolutely, because so, that warms my heart every time. So Crokit is a free app. It, create, it allows you to record 30 seconds of audio. It's great for kids who have language delays or are too young to be fully blogging but still want to communicate with the world. All it is is on the app they just push to Crok and then it allows them to record 30 seconds and then when it's done it gives them a URL to share out. Um, here's an example of a first grader's blog, Becca from Chicago. Um, she is in a class of a colleague of mine, um, Kristen Zemke. Here's Kristen's Twitter handle, at First Grade Thinks. And um, we can't, Sue and I can't get enough of this because in this example, Becca was coming with us to a Chicago Public Schools professional development and we were having kids do app speed dating. They were presenting apps to teachers in a speed dating-like setting so that the teachers were dating an app. Um, which we might need to change the name since there's kids, but it was still cute and amazing and empowering for both the kids and the teachers. So that morning, um, Becca could not handle how excited she was about being asked to teach adults. So she woke up really early and recorded this croquet. Hi, my name is... Hi, my name is Becca, and I am teaching Crokit, and I'm teaching adult teachers if they don't know Crokit, because it's really fun one, and also I like it. So, I want to teach them, and it's Friday 2013, and the day is what? February 1st, and I'm so excited to do it, because I am teaching the adults. It's so exciting. That warms my heart every time. I, I, I hear it. I joke to Kristen that I want to make this my ringtone if it wouldn't be so incredibly <laughs> creepy to have a random adult doing it. But the reason that I love it so much and that I want to hear it all the time is because it reminds me that, can you hear the excitement in her voice? I mean, the, the, the power of teaching a kid that their voice should be heard and they can teach someone else is so amazing, and we often forget to do it with our youngest learners. Um, Anne wanted to know about uh, Schoology again, and she wanted to ask about, is, does it have a correcting feature that can be done automatically in the app? Um, it does automatically grade all of the um, single response choices, so multiple choice, matching, sequencing, um, 
short response. However, the essay questions you need to self-grade. Uh, Lois asks us to spell one of the apps, but I'm not sure which one she means. If she means Crooked, it's croak, like a frog, C-R-O-A-K dot I-T. Um, Anne wants, to know, wants us to tell you that Crooked is an iPhone app, which is true. So um, it can be used on the iPad, but you can use your little magnifying button to make it big, so it can be used on an iPad as well. Um, and uh, Fluberu, oh, yep, yeah, so Anne wants to know about whether or not it grades it, like Fluberu does in Google Docs, which is true. Um, so that kind of does it for us. Here's our information. Um, I'm Jenny McGarra, and on uh, Twitter, I am at Ms. McGarra, M-I-M-S-M-A-G-I-E-R-A. And Sue? I am Sue Gorman, at S-J Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N. And here's my blog, teaching like at 2999.blogspot.com. And on that blog, I also have some other resources, including, um, let's see here, including an app list for your you listeners. Um, it's not just for you listeners, it's for everybody. Um, but these are some of our favorite um, free, um, and the only one that costs money is Book Creator, but creation apps that allow you to get your kids to be creating and being critical thinkers instead of, like we said at the beginning, using apps that are simply uh, review or fact fluency or worksheet-like uh, worksheet -like gamified um, app. So these are some of our favorite. These are the ones that we felt are truly transformative. So we encourage you to check them out. And you can find that again on my blog uh, or by uh, just looking us up. And I'm sure Sue has many resources as well. Sue, what's your blog site again? I actually mostly put it on my Pinterest site. And so I okay. put that. I pin apps. And so um, that is the way that I am reaching um, besides Twitter. I'm big on Twitter as well. Uh, to reach oh. um, most of the people I uh, am in contact with. Awesome. So follow Sue on Twitter, and you will get a lot of amazing resources for her. So thank you so much for joining us today. We had a great time chatting about one of our favorite things, um, uh, which is iPads and education. Um, for those of you, I just saw a chat. What is the blog address again? It's right up there at the top, teaching like it's twenty nine ninety nine. Have a great uh, Tuesday. Hopefully those of you who are in the Midwest aren't as snowed in as we are. And stay safe and enjoy transforming your classrooms. Thank you. Thank you.